have to say, so I'm excited for all of you to have a chance to witness her work and to see what she's done. Um, she's been a fine mover in London. I don't know if you know that she's won the Governor General Queen's Jubilee Award in um, the 125th anniversary of the Confederation of Canadian Medals. So that's, you're, you're speaking to, or you'll be engaged with somebody who's got a lot of experience and who's really come forward in our community to make changes. She was also involved with the um, Provincial Silent Witness Program and with the internationally recognized Shine the Light on Women Abuse projects. So she's got a lot of experience. And her, the, the nature of her talk will be very controversial, be very rewarding for some of you to hear and very securing for some of you to hear. She's a phenomenal advocate, as other people who are here who have experienced that can tell you. And at the same time, she'll be nicely controversial because she is, if you haven't heard a radical feminist speak before, she's a radical feminist. So I'd like to introduce you to Megan, the Executive Director of the London Abused Women's Centre. Since 1997, she's held that position and her focus or goal is to, is committed to eliminating all forms of men's violence against women, including pornography, and prostitution in a culture of rape. So welcome everybody. Okay, Emma, is this on? Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. I am really happy to be here today with you. And um, the topic is, as you can see, a uh, culture of pornography and rape. And um, so obviously there is sensitive material that we will be speaking about today. Um, if for some reason, any reason at all you feel triggered by what I have to say, I would encourage you to step out. Um, do we have anybody here, do you know, that um, can step out with anybody or not? Definitely. Okay, perfect. So there are two individuals here that if you feel um, that you need to step out, they will likely go out after you and just make sure you're okay. Um, but please take care of yourself because this can be a triggering issue. Um, most of you in this room, or at least many of you in this room, are under about the age of 25, and that means your entire life you have grown up in a culture of rape. Um, for you, this is just normal. I'm going to bring up some issues today, and you're going to say, well, what's the big deal? This is what I've always known. And I hope when you leave today, you will think about some of the things that I'm talking about, um, and question some of the things you've seen in the media and leave with a better understanding of what we mean when we talk about a culture of pornography and rape. So what is porn and rape culture? So porn culture is generally defined as a culture where raunchy, explicit and often misogynist themes and images pervade the culture landscape. So when I grew up, I was born in 1961, so I'm 52 years old, and just prior to being born in about 1953, we came out with, uh, or society came out with Playboy magazine, and that was considered at the time the introduction really to pornography. Over time, pornography has been much more uh, explicit and much more harmful to women. So in today's culture, it is not unusual to see women being violently abused. Um, and uh, in many instances, the entire theme of the pornography that is available to be downloaded is about really body punishing, hurtful, um, multiple gang rapes, um, invasive uh, acts of sex on women, where women have no enjoyment in the pornography, it's all about men enjoying themselves, where women continually say no, 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 but in fact the message means yes, 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 more punishment on me where rape is the theme, and in fact, if you Google rape porn on the internet, um, you'll likely see an excess of about 20 million hits. 
And a rape culture is an environment where rape is really prevalent and sexual violence against uh, women is normalized and excused in the media and in our pop culture. So it's perpetuated through everything you will see. Uh, through language, the objectification of women's bodies, the glamorization of um, sexual violence, and what we're doing is creating a society where women are just objects. Women are no longer considered to be human beings. So when we talk about examples of a rape culture, you know, we see this every day where we're blaming women. She deserved what she got. Did you see what she was wearing? Did you see how she was flirting with him, leading him on? Did you see how drunk she was? Obviously, she deserved what she got. So these are examples of what we're seeing in a rape culture, where we're trivializing the sexual assault. And I often see this with women who come into our office who are young women, uh, adolescent girls who have been harassed or uh, sexually assaulted through the internet uh, with images of themselves being posted or being told over the internet that they're sluts and give good blowjobs and will involve the parents of the perpetrators of these um, posts and the mothers or fathers of the perpetrators will often say come on lighten up boys will be boys well in fact those are not things that boys should be doing. But in your generation, of course, these are things that have been going on for the last 25 years. And parents, too, are becoming normalized to this behavior. We often hear it's been all, this is always the way it's been happening. We've always done it this way. And so just because we've always done it this way, People are thinking this is just completely normal and we should always continue to do it this way. There are so many sexually explicit jokes that everybody finds incredibly hilarious that are always at the expense of women and their bodies. Again, these are things that contribute to our rape culture. Tolerance of sexual harassment. We see sexual harassment not only on college and university campuses, we see it in the workplace, we see it when women walk down the street and men are whistling and harassing them. We see it everywhere we go where women are the brunt of harassment by men. And the number of times that I am told that rape statistics include false claims of rape she lied. She agreed to have sex with that guy and woke up in the morning and said, oh my God, what have I done? She's a liar. And in fact, as I go through this presentation, you will see that rape statistics uh, and reports to the police are grossly underrepresented because women are fearful to go to the police to report rape. And of course, this relates back to uh, the first point I made about the public that continues to scrutinize how women dress, their mental state, their motives, and their history. She has a reputation for being a slut or a whore. She sleeps around, so she gets what she deserves. She has slept with everybody in her class. So do you actually believe that she was raped last night? Give me a break. We live in a society where we are always after women, teaching women how not to get raped instead of investing resources in teaching men not to rape. It's always on the shoulders of women. Watch how you walk down the street. Watch how you dress. Watch how much you drink. Don't go in a, uh, alone, go in a group. Make sure you have a buddy system. Watch you don't put your drink down for fear somebody puts a drug in it. How often do we hear about programs to say to men, do you know what consent is? 
Do you know that you can be arrested? If she's saying to you, no, do you know you can be arrested if you rape a woman who's passed out on that couch? We don't invest enough in teaching men not to rape. So we know from every research project, every stat that's been collected over the last 18 to 20 years, that in Canada, the group at the highest risk of being sexually assaulted is a group of girls in the age group of 13 to 15. 13 to 15. That's the group that is at the highest risk of being sexually assaulted. Those are your kid sisters. Those are your nieces. And in some cases, those were you at that age. We know that as girls approach those years, their self-confidence plummets, and the rate of depression soars. And we shouldn't be depressed, or sorry, we shouldn't be surprised when we see girls in that age group now committing suicide, as we've seen all over the world recently. Amanda Todd on the West Coast, Retea Parsons on the East Coast, 40 girls this year alone in Canada in that age group committed suicide. Mm -hmm. That's what ha is happening to our young girls today. So did you say 40? 40, 40. So we know that when girls are exposed to sexualized images on television, through video games, through music videos, those girls become extremely critical of their own body image. They start to feel that they don't measure up. They start to feel that Miley Cyrus has this beautiful body, and they don't. That porn stars have beautiful bodies, and they don't. That models in magazines have beautiful bodies, and they don't. That they don't measure up. And what they want is to have the same level of attention paid to them by boys and men as all of those superstars do. All of them that we interview in our office between the ages of 12 and 15 identify to us that what they want is to be somebody else, to look like somebody else. Girls do not identify that they're happy with who they are. And that's an incredibly sad situation. This is what we are exposed to on an ongoing basis today. T-shirts, four out of five people enjoy gang rape. Keep calm and hit her. Keep calm and rape a lot. And some people wear these around and think they're really cool and think it's really funny. These are from magazine ads, which only go to perpetrate the, the rape uh, culture we live in. But they're used to sell products, clothing, alcohol, cars. Rape a girl and kill her after. That's what these are perpetuating. Isn't rape just great? We can rape a girl and stuff her in the trunk of a car, but it's okay because we're selling clothes. And this is what girls are exposed to every single day. And this is what men are exposed to. And so men are looking at this, and this is just normalizing what goes on in the world. This is our rape culture. This is normalizing rape. So. This young woman, it says here that it's safe to say that she loves her socks. And then on the left hand side you can see her looking a little bit erotic. So on the right side, you may not be able to read that, it says, meet Lauren Phoenix, 150 pounds of magic, actress, director, Look her up on Google. And this is an ad for American Apparel. American Apparel is a very popular clothing store. Very expensive in some cases. Lots of young girls want to go to American Apparel. Well, if you look 
Lauren Phoenix up on Google, you, are, you will find that she's a porn star. And so young girls and guys will go to American Apparel because of this ad to buy not the socks, but other pieces of clothing. And they will also look up Lauren Phoenix. And her pornography is available for free on a download. <coughs> and so you can watch Lauren Phoenix doing all sorts of things, sexual things to men and men to her. And this is American Apparel, mainstream clothing store. Virgin Mobile put this ad out last Christmas. The gift of Christmas surprise. Necklace or chloroform? Both intended result is to have sex with your wife. A necklace, you give her the necklace and isn't that lovely? She'll have sex with you then. Or you can do the same thing with chloroform. That'll knock her out and you can rape her. So this ran last year in magazines across the states and also on television. And there was such a public outcry that Virgin was forced to remove it. Had there been no outcry, this would have continued to run through the festive Christmas season. We now see little girls who love their Polly Pockets. And Polly Pockets are now available to little girls as pole dancers. Because uh, pole dancing is now available to the public as exercise. It's marketed to par as party, you know, a great time at the pole dancing studio, learn how to become a striptease artist. And little girls, it's normal behavior for little girls to know that Polly Pocket can now be a pole dancer and they can teach Polly Pocket how to do it too. This is what little girls are growing up to play with. So we really can't escape rape culture. We see it in music. Snoop Dogg, who actually is a pornographer, has, has produced pornography, who always takes on his tours prostituted women, who has a song, Oh, I Want Some Pussy. And when he plays that song at bars, do you know who requests it most often? Young women. And they are out there dancing it. To it. And as one um, disc jockey said, he was a black disc jockey, said, that's the same as me asking for a song that is degrading to the black, black population and out there dancing to that. But girls are out there saying, I want that song by Snoop Dogg, oh, I want some pussy. Eminem, who talks about killing women in his life, Miley Cyrus, who is out uh, dancing and gyrating with a man who's old enough to be her father. Uh, Robin Thicke, who writes uh, a song, Blurred Lines, which really is about raping women. And of course, Chris Brown, who beat uh, his girlfriend, uh, Rihanna, and uh, then went on and promised her he'd never do it again, reconciled, did it again, has now just been arrested on further charges and could face time in jail. Video games, Grand Theft Auto, supposed to be available to those over the age of 18, but parents line up with their 11 and 12 year old children, spend the whole night lined up in front of the video store to buy this for their children. And of course you get bonus points for killing prostituted women. The newest version, uh, most of the points are given to torture scenes. It's all about violence against women. But parents think it's okay to buy these games that perpetuate violence. And when people say to me, oh God, you can lighten up. There's no impact on children with these video games. I kind of think to myself, really? You know, recently we saw this man, Tim Bosma, who was trying to sell his truck on Kijiji. And a man came to uh, test drive the truck. 
and Tim Bosma disappeared. And they later found him burned. He'd been put through an incinerator. And they arrested two men uh, and charged them with murder of Tim Bosma. They're still looking for uh, the remains of another woman who they believe has also been killed by the uh, alleged perpetrators of Tim Bosma. And they are also suspect that Tim Bosma and his friend had something to do with Tim Bosma's father, who also died. And they're labeling it a thrill kill. And it's thrill kills that are seen in Grand Theft Auto. And we're starting to see what goes on in movies and in pornography and in video games replicated in real life. And if they didn't, if these things didn't have an impact on real life, you'd have to really question how is it that marketing campaigns don't have an impact on real life? How is it that Nike became so popular, for instance? Because Nike markets its product to the public. And the public buys in. And they're spending millions and millions of dollars to get the public to buy their product. In the same way that Grand Theft Auto is marketing their product and making you a part of their game to have the same emotional response playing their game as you would in real life. So it does bleed. It leaks. And it makes you a part of the problem. Television programs. Criminal Minds. You watch Criminal Minds? Anybody in here watch that program? That program is brutal. It's about sexual violence and torture. And if you watch that program for the first time, you'll be horrified. You watch that program a couple times? No, not so much. It becomes pretty normal. There was a fellow out on the West Coast, Robert Picton. Does anybody here know who Robert Picton is? Mm -hmm. He was uh, convicted of uh, murdering a number of prostituted women that he ground up, basically. Put them through a grinder. Criminal Minds duplicated that exact scene in one of its programs. And you know, People didn't even respond. They didn't think anything of it. The same with the CSI programs. Rapes are reported based on real life rapes. And nobody sheds a tear. Nobody thinks anything of it. Because we see these things so often in television that are poorly acted. And people laugh. And we become normalized to those events. American top model. You know, it's about promoting women as a, as a um, you know, specific body type. Oh, and then they, they did try to have the large women on there. And the large women were a size 10 or 12. Really? You know, since when did large women become a size 10 or 12? That should be the norm. Is it any wonder that women who are 140 or 50 pounds think they're fat? when instead that's supposed to be healthy. And reality television, who ever thought we would live in a society where Honey Boo Boo would be a star? <laughs> Honest to goodness, sister wives, the bachelor and bachelorette, keeping up with the Kardashians, toddlers and tiaras, all of these programs are glamorizing misogyny and rape culture. And yet there are young people and women across the nation who just can't wait to get home to watch them, who talk about it at the water cooler in the way that we should be talking about the news. Because for them, that is the news. The news is no longer about the number of people in the country that are starving, or the number of people in the country that are being murdered or the environment. The news now is that Kim Kardashian has had a baby. 
And as I saw, showed you earlier in the um, uh, magazine ads, the ad campaigns, sex sells. And it's the sexual exploitation of women and girls that is selling products. Women are no longer human beings. They are a piece of meat used to sell a product. So I'm not sure if everybody's aware of what happened at St. Mary's University, but just I want to play this for you so you get some feedback and some uh, understanding of this rape chant. Oh, sorry. Uh, I think I have to press this one. Oh, there's no sound. How do we get sound on this? Oh, you look great. Thank you so much. Is that working? Oh, yeah. Publicity and awareness about sexism and what's appropriate and what's not the message would get through, but it obviously hasn't, not to a group of university students in Halifax. They thought it was funny to lead hundreds of students in a chant during orientation week, a chant that glorifies rape and sex with underage girls. It was only when someone posted video of it online that the outrage began. Ross Lord has the story and a warning, some of the language in it is offensive. There's no doubt this video is offensive. What's unclear is what the three to four hundred students who chanted it were thinking. On the campus of St. Mary's University, the video, becoming known as the rape chant, is being denounced by other students. I think it's pretty terrible, really. I just don't understand how somebody ever thought that it was a good idea to sing about this. Nova Scotia's premier is also dismayed. I would hope that the young people who are involved in this today would understand the gravity of what they have said and would appreciate that it is wrong on many levels. In Ottawa, Nova Scotia Cabinet Minister Peter McKay is even more outraged. Quite frankly, I find it uh, offensive and dangerous. Uh, as somebody that has uh, sisters, uh, nieces who are currently in university in Atlantic Canada, uh, it's deeply troubled. And social workers are dumbfounded, especially after a series of sexual awareness programs launched since the suicide of teenager Retea Parsons, who was allegedly raped. You would think that we would be more informed, more diligent, more knowledgeable um, about messaging than any other part of the country. It happened here. You know, it happened here in Nova Scotia. The student council president at St. Mary's approved of the chat and took part. Smeeso would like to apologize to everyone in the SME community for our part such an awful display. But student leaders didn't think twice about a message promoting forced sex with young girls until someone posted the video online. A lot of our cheers don't, you know, when we when we do them, we don't necessarily look at the message. It's more about the rhyme and, and the chant behind it. The university administration says it's puzzled at how student leaders thought the chant on this football field was acceptable despite discussions about sexual abuse before Frost Week even started. We had a police officer from HRM talk about sexual assault and... I'm just going to go on. This is a duplicate one, which is from the University of British Columbia. But you know, oh, we've always done that chant, uh, St. Mary's. We always did that chant. It's always been available. We, we never really thought. It was just, you know, it was a great chant because it rhymed. Just incredible, and that's what I'm talking about. You know, so normalized. We always did these rape chants. What's the big deal? So let's just talk about it and break it down. The young rape chant. Why is for your sister? Always oh, for oh so tight. It's a virgin you're talking about. You is for underage, which is a section, which is a criminal offense. N is for no consent. 
in case you are not perfectly clear, no consent is rape. G is for go to jail. That's their chant. That's what they think is really great. And if you are a first year university student at Frosh Week, and the leaders of the student population are telling you you have to do this, what's the likelihood that you're not going to do it? Not very high, given who wants to be the loser during Frosh Week, right? So they've interviewed kids from first year afterwards who were incredibly upset who were crying during the interviews, who were saying, I didn't have a choice but to participate. So let's talk for a minute about how this impacts young people. Does everybody here, anybody here know the story of Carla Hamolka and Bernardo? Okay. So they were a married couple uh, Paul Bernardo was a serial rapist who then hooked up with Carla Hamolka and together they became torturers, rapists, and ultimately killers. One of their victims was Carla Hamolka's own sister, Tammy, who was 15 years old when on Christmas night she decided to give her husband, Paul Bernardo, her sister, her virginal sister, Tammy, as a Christmas gift. And so they first of all put sedatives in her drink, in her rum and eggnog drink, and then she worked in a vet's office, so she gave her, put uh, on a cloth some anis, uh, anesthesiology or anesthetic, whatever that's called, that puts you to sleep, put it over her mouth until she passed out, and then jointly they raped Tammy Homolka. During the rape, Tammy Homolka choked on her own vomit and died. And rather than taking immediate care of Tammy Homoka, they did the laundry of her clothing, and they cleaned her up, and cleaned the space around her, and then went and told her parents that she had choked on her vomit from drinking too much, and they called the police and emergency services. Although she had a bad burn on her face, likely from the anis, what's it called, the anesthetic, is that what it's called? Yeah, likely from that. Uh, the police and emergency services accepted their story that she had died of uh, too much alcohol and she was laid to rest. They then went on to rape and torture other women uh, who were also killed. Later her body was exhumed and it was determined she was uh, killed from the anesthetic. So we're talking in that rape chant about your sister, who's a virgin, who's underage, who's not giving consent. The part that's missing is going to jail. Because in most of these cases, it is too hard to prove rape. And nobody is held accountable. So I frankly don't find that funny at all. And I'm also going to tell you that Car uh, Carla Mocha's sister, Tammy, is not the only one that's ever gone through this. Anyone aware of what happened in Steubenville, Ohio? Oh, these two young men, 16 years old, wonderful, brilliant students and football players, they had a great night with a young woman one night. They were all at a party together young woman, they all got out the vodka and started drinking. She became incredibly intoxicated. She vomited, but they pulled her into the car anyway to go to another party. And while they were in the vehicle with her, they uh, took off her pants and her shirt 
And one of the men digitally penetrated her with his finger, and they took pictures. And they started posting those pictures. But that wasn't the end of it. They took her back to a house, and there was more digital penetration and more pictures. And she, the next day, had no memory, but the pictures were on social media. So she realized that against her will, she had been raped. Because in the state of Ohio, it's not intercourse that's rape, but digital penetration. So she went to the police, and even though the football coaches and the teachers tried to protect these boys by covering everything up, there was enough evidence from the pictures to move to trial. So this young 15-year-old woman, with all the strength she could muster, even though she was bullied in the entire, by the entire town because she was going after the two football stars, had the strength to move forward and testify in trial. The coaches, everybody was, the harassment online, the letters that were written to her home, her parents were ostracized, but she did it. She went to trial and they were convicted. And as young offenders, they were sentenced to serve a minimum of two years in jail. And this was one of the first tweets that came out about that. Those poor boys, all because the pictures and texts made that little whore decide to play victim after it was all over. Remember, this is a woman that was flat out passed out. She had no recollection. It was as if she was dead. She was so passed out. So, this is CNN's coverage of the event. This is CNN Breaking News. I'm Kenny Crowley in Washington. Reliable Sources is just ahead, but first, a breaking story we're following. Two star high school football players in Steubenville, Ohio, have been found guilty of raping a West Virginia teenager. The story has attracted national attention. The judge just ruled a few moments ago. Listen in. In this case, um, no. Um, regarding the charges of rape, both defendants, Malik Richmond and Trenton Mays, are committed to the Department of Youth Services for a minimum period of one year, a maximum period of two year 21. Again, this case was played out in juvenile court. That is why there is a judge, no jury. He decided on the verdict, as well as you heard there uh, talking about the sentence. We want to go now to CNN's Poppy Harlow. She is in Steubenville, has been covering this trial. I cannot imagine, having just watched this on the feed coming in, uh, how emotional that must have been sitting in the courtroom. I never experienced anything like it, Candy. Um, it was incredibly emotional, incredibly difficult even for an outsider like me to watch what happened as these two young men that had such promising futures, star football players, very good students, literally watched as, as they believed their life fell apart. One of, one of the young men, Malik Richmond, when that sentence came down, he collapsed. He collapsed in the arms of his attorney, Walter Madison. He said to him, my life is over. No one is going to want me now. Very serious crime here. Both found guilty of raping the 16-year-old girl at a series of parties back in August. Alcohol-fueled parties. Alcohol a huge part in this. But Trent Mays was also found guilty on a second count, and that is a felony illegal use of a minor in nudity-oriented material because he took a photograph of the victim laying naked on the floor that night. Trent Mays will serve two years in a juvenile detention facility. Uh, Malik Richmond will serve one year on that one count that he was found guilty for. But I want to let our viewers listen because for the first time in this entire trial, we have now... So, you don't need to listen to anymore. But it went on and on and on about these poor boys and oh, how could their lives ever move on? They will be impacted by this for years to come. Not one mention of the victim. 
And I can tell you that women who have been raped and girls who have been raped, it's a lifetime. They are triggered for the rest of their lives. But mainstream media did not once mention the pain inflicted by those boys on that young woman. That is rape culture. So, you know, we hear all the time about these, these dreaded women, these girls that lie, you know, they, they, they agree to have sex with these boys the night before, and the next day they change their mind and they wish they hadn't done it, and then they uh, make up this story and they go to the police with a lie. So let's just talk for a moment about that because, in fact, what we know is fewer than 10% of women and girls that are raped or sexually assaulted will ever report that to the police. Fewer than 10%. So of those that we know of, 460,000, that's, you know, remember, only fewer than 10% ever go to the police. 460,000 reported cases that went to the police, that we, or sorry, that we know of, 15,200 went to the police. And this is in a survey. So of those 15,200 that reported to the police, 13,200 were reported as a crime. And of that, 5,544 resulted in charges being laid, the Crown Attorney across the country, Crown's Attorney across the country, decided to prosecute 2,824, and of that, 1,500 were convicted. We know in these cases, conviction rates are very, very low. That going to the police is a horrendous experience. That going through the criminal justice system is often described as being more traumatic than the actual rape. And the majority of women will never ever report to the police. And when women come into our office to report their rapes, and we talk to them about the pros and cons of going to the police, only rarely will they agree to go to the police. So we all know about Retea Parsons, gang raped, a gang. You know, learn through pornography. When somebody says no, it really means yes. She was drunk. Everybody said, well, these young women, they're drinking too much. We have to stop them from drinking. And I'm like, no, we need to stop men from raping girls. But she was gang raped. Picture of her taken, circulated through social media. She was called a whore and a slut. She was chased out of her school. She was chased out of her town. She ultimately committed suicide. Police had been brought in to investigate. Even though there were pictures available and pictures circulating through social media, the police said there was not enough evidence to charge the boys responsible. It was the final blow to her, and she did uh, commit suicide. So at this point, what has happened is that uh, after her death, the police, the RCMP, did reopen the investigation. Uh, Nova Scotia now has passed legislation uh, just this past August, uh, allowing victims to seek protection from cyberbullying and sue their perpetrators. And we do not call that cyberbullying. That is sexual harassment. And we're never going to resolve the issue of sexual harassment on the internet if we continue to call it cyberbullying. When you circulate negative, or sorry, uh, sexual pictures of a woman uh, with boys having sex with her, or men having sex with her while she is passed out, that's not bullying. That's sexual harassment, that's sexual assault. And we need to start naming things if we're ever gonna resolve them. So how did we get to this place? It's because of this sexually toxic and pornified culture that we live in. We're grooming kids to think it's completely normal. Um, and we're grooming adults, the parents, to accept it as normal as, uh, as well. So we're grooming our kids 
to, uh, to accept and act, act out on the uh, sexuality of prostitution and pornography. We're grooming our kids to think that it's okay to be raped. We're grooming our kids, our boys, to think it's okay to rape women, that gang rape is what women and girls want. Um, girls are learning that they can sell themselves, that they are a commodity. If they want liquor, they can offer themselves up, offer themselves to a boy, I'll give you a blowjob if you buy me a Mickey. We see that all too often. Um, they are commodities. Girls and women have, been co have become commodities in today's society. And we are grooming boys to act like pimps and buyers. Boys are only too available to accept that blowjob and get that Mickey. A pimp is, um, who wants to know that? Okay. Oh, you do. The interpreter is asking. I need to. I need to expand. Oh, a pimp is uh, the person that sells the woman for sex. Sorry. Does that help? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So what we're really doing is we're robbing boys of healthy sexual development. Boys are no longer learning what it means to be intimate, what it means to have a long-term meaningful relationship. Boys and young men are learning today all about hookup relationships, but not about healthy relationships. The average age when a boy first views pornography is age 11. And we're teaching girls that their value lies in their, uh, in their bodies and in the ability to attract male attention. I covered that earlier. Girls are sexualized starting at a young age. Most girls start to uh, engage in sexual relations when they are now 12 years old. By age 13, girls are starting to want porn star looks. They're starting to wear bras that give them cleavage even if they don't have breasts. Um, and when they do behave in this way and dress this way, they are given the label slut, which stays with them throughout all of their public school, high school, and often into university and contributes to their depression. These are some of the ads and, or certain newspaper articles you'll see frequently. I just want to talk to you a little bit about the one in the upper corner. Jamie is 13, hasn't even kissed a girl. He's now on the sex offender registry. This guy got, a uh, young kid got addicted to pornography, um, started spending about two hours a day in his bedroom watching pornography, lost all of his friends, um, really felt he couldn't go anywhere, started engaging in more and more um, harmful pornography, uh, violent pornography, pornography involving animals. Um, he finally, the police arrived at his door because they were doing a big investigation into child pornography and found somebody in that house had been downloading child pornography and it was him. And it was a 13 year old boy, his parents were horrified to discover it. Um, and we are seeing now that more and more Kids under the age of 18 are seeking help and support and treatment, counseling for their pornography addictions. And that is just one situation. So here we have a 13 year old kid, he's registered now as a sex offender. Is that amazing? So, how on earth are we ever going to get over this? Well, we have to stop using language that objectifies and uh, exploits women. Women are not sluts. Women are not whores. Women are individuals. Women are human beings. Women are loving and caring and bright and intelligent. Stop objectifying women. And if you hear anybody making an offensive joke or trivializing rape, stand up. Speak out against it. If you have a friend that's been raped, take her seriously. Believe her and support her. Think critically about the media's message about women, men, relationships, and violence. And boycott. We ran a boycott against old Milwaukee ads because they were so sexually exploitive. 
Be respectful of other people's space, even in casual relationships. And always communicate with your sexual partners. Don't assume consent. Talk about it. Don't let stereotypes of either gender define or shape your actions. And get involved. It's probably the most important thing you can do. Get involved and take action. I love this ad. Instead of telling women to carry a gun, tell men not to rape. And we need curriculum changes now, starting in kindergarten and working every year through. Consent is not addressed in school curriculums. Not now, never has been. New technology and impact of it is not addressed in school curriculums. People have no idea what their children are doing on their phones. Sexual assault is not addressed in school curriculums. Most kids don't know how to address it. And teaching boys and men to not rape, which is probably the most valuable education that we can provide, is not addressed in school curriculums. You need to know that consent is defined as the voluntary agreement to engage in sexual activity. Voluntary uh, agreement to engage. So the new law that we have now outlines when there is no consent, and that's when agreement is expressed. So nobody else can agree to that consent except the woman herself. If the woman is incapable of consenting, if she's unconscious or mental incapacity, that's not consent. And if you are in a position of trust or power, for, and if you're threatening her, that's not consent. And if the victim expresses lack of consent by words, resistance or silence, that's not consent. And if, she if the woman says, yes, let's do it, and then changes her mind, she's changed her mind. That's not consent. And if you breach any of those things, it's rape, and you can go to jail. But my favorite Mahatma Gandhi quote is, be the change that you wish to see in the world. And we're asking that you value women and recognize that women are intelligent, equal, beautiful sisters, and all of those other things. the Social Science Speaker Series, I want to say thank you for coming and listening to this very important presentation. Two words, if you are interested in more information, you can come to the front and perhaps speak to Megan. I'm sorry we didn't have time for questions. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with CBC, but there are two Doc Zone documentaries that are related to this presentation that you might be interested in Googling. One is called Sexed Up Kids, S-E-X-T, Kids. Um, you can take a look for that. And CBC is just putting out a new um, documentary that has to do with pornography that I'm not sure has been released, but is very soon to come. If you're interested in that information, you could also ask your professors, and they will get you in touch with me, and I will forward it to you. If anyone has questions or concerns, they could come to the front. I would also, again, like to thank Megan Walker for coming to Fanshawe to present for the speaker series. Thank you.